everybody to Dat Poker Podcast, episode 145 for August 14th, 2023. I'm your host, A. Schwartz, alongside uh, Roscoe P. Coltrane. Hey there. Terrence Chan in Kelowna, BC. Terrence, how are you? Hello. I'm, I'm glad you've escaped jail, as we talked about last week. I escaped. Uh, you got out of jail. Ross uh, R- Ross is, is growing a mustache that looks like it should put him in jail. I don't know what's <laughs> happening there. but uh, It's unfortunate, that mustache. Uh, Daniel in the Grand in Las Vegas. Daniel with the robe on. Is that the... Is that the Hefner look? What do you got? Is that? Oh, it's a hoodie. Oh, it looks a bit like a robe. It's just, you know, yeah. You, what, I mean, that, this is just a nice, smooth hoodie. You guys had robe. I don't know how you got. I had robe, but it would it would be great. I mean, like the the t shirt is just close enough to flesh colored that it was plausible that oh, you were just wearing a robe. Naked. Yeah, yeah. This is actually yeah. a gym tank. I didn't want to do the gun thing and whatever because I don't have any right now. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. It's all making sense now. All making sense. Yeah. Uh, I want to quickly say happy uh, sixth anniversary, boys. Cheers. We made it six years. Um, you know, there were some people that maybe didn't think we were going to make it that long. Uh, I don't, don't want to say any names or anything, but. Well, it's funny you say that because this morning, Nick Fertucci reached out to me because he wanted to do an interview. And uh, I said I was doing my pod tonight. And he's like, you, you have a pod? <laughs> and I was like, he goes, is it new? And I was like, uh, well, we've been doing about six years. We're 150. <laughs> so I'm here on the ball. It's like, all right. Can I listen to it on live? I'm like, you know. It's Probably. Uh, <laughs> yes. We made it. Uh, all right. Uh, lots to go over today. Uh, we did do our, our World Series of Poker wrap-up show uh, last time. So if you want to uh, go back and uh, hear about the World Series of Poker, you can check that out. We're going to move on to some new stuff uh, going on, including the looking forward to the next World Series. Well, two versions of it, an online and a live version. So we'll talk about that coming up. Um, first, let's just wrap up quickly the uh, the Triton Poker Series that finished in London. 14 events. Um, two players really kind of dominated that. Uh, guys you might have heard of, Phil Ivey and Jason Kuhn. Ivey wins two events, uh, has a second and a sixth. Again, this is just 14 events. Four top six finishes there, racks up over $2 million in caches. Uh, Jason Kuhn, two wins, five caches, and wins over $3 million. For the series, so lots and lots of money being uh, being won and lost over uh, in London. I'm sure uh, there might have been some side action as well. Uh, but these Triton Poker Series, Daniel, I know we ask you all the time: um, Is there any FOMO when you when you see some of the boys uh, taking down some of this cash? Yeah, any FOMO, all the FOMO. <laughs> I wake up every morning and I sweat it and I watch it, you know. And you see a guy like Coon who's been crushing it, you know, in the high stakes arena, whatever. And then you have the, in my opinion, the goat, Bill Ivey. Phil, I was, I was, it was just fun to watch, you know, and I see Phil doing some stuff that is uh, not what others are doing, you know. So, like, that's what I like to pay attention to when I watch the Tritons. I'm like, who's doing things different? Because it's easy to just go with the flow and be a sheep and follow the herd and go, well, everyone says this is GTO. You got to do this. You got to do that. You can't call three bets with that hand, blah, blah, blah. Phil goes his own, you know, he's, he beats his own drum. And it sort of uh, reminds me, too, you know, wisdom, experience, his reading ability. Uh, is what, you know, what sets him apart. Because, like, you look at some of the fundamental stuff that he's doing, and on paper, there is no wizard or anybody that's going to say that's correct. But guess what? <laughs> yeah, guess what? He finds a way to make it work, which is impressive. So, fun to watch. Good to see Phil Ivey back. You know, he, he's, he's there for the Tritons. Um, hopefully, we can get him out for some of the series, uh, you know, in paradise as well. Yeah, looking forward to that. We'll, we'll hit on that later. Um, Jason Kuhn, uh, obviously, you know, one of the best players uh, out there right now would he be terrence the guy that you would if you were going to stakes one person are you picking coon oh yeah that's a good one because there's a this is a guy who has all the integrity in the world and of course if you're talking about staking um that that would really be a part of it in addition to being a crusher but yeah i was super happy to see coon crush it and uh you know, just since we're talking about this show and people not knowing we have a podcast, people may not know if they're new. Jason Kuhn joined us all the way back in episode 55. It's honestly one of the, the favorite episodes, one of my most favorite episodes that that we've ever done here is he went into depth about talking about what it takes to be an elite level player in, you know, what was that, 2021 or whatever it was, uh, but it still applies now. So, yes, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, like I don't know enough about the super high roller scene to know who's the best of the best and who has the highest EV. But I, I would 
trust Jason Kuhn with any amount of money any day of the week for sure. So that's that's got to be a big you part. You can of have it. one guy to stake in those Triton series. Who is it? I'm going to take the best player in the world. Phil Ivey. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't I don't have any personal integrity issues with Phil. I don't like that's not a concern for me. I just like that Phil will whatever the game is. You know, he'll figure it out. He figures it out quickly, and he's when he's in the zone. When Phil Ivey's stroking, right? He can do things that nobody else can do. Because everyone else is looking at like, all right, what are my combos to call with here? What are my combos to fall? And Phil Ivey's looking at, I, this guy's bluffing, period. You know, and that, there's something to be said about that. I know the other Phil calls it white magic. I think that Phil would beg to differ and say it's a different color magic. But uh, <laughs> well, whatever it is, um, yeah, I mean, listen, for, for, for many, many years, when Phil Ivey's got his head on straight, which he does right now, there he's just been able to be dominant in everything that he does. Do, and I don't mean just like, you know, just dominant, like the best. And I think that, uh, you know, his, his results in Triton and, and he doesn't play that much. He doesn't get as many reps, you know? Um, but yeah, Kuhn is definitely up there too, but I, I go with the old school guy, Phil Ivey, and that would be my guy. Think- when, when you're talking about him making his reads, so like this guy just doesn't have it right now. Do you think even, do, do you think it's like analytical? Like, like he, he knows like, Hey, this guy's done this thing in the past. Or do you think it's just like a gut feeling? Like I'm looking at this guy and something just doesn't quite feel right. Like how much of it is, is stuff, stuff that he's seen in the past from people or, 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 and how much of it is just, just not right now. I don't know why, but spidey senses. So what's the difference between when I, I hate to use these, but they're just the ones that speak to me because he's his mannerisms, whatever, like Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, Phil Ivey. What sets them apart as far as I'm concerned is their intense, uh, focus and determination. And when he plays and he's alone, he sees everything. He's picking up on every little thing, whether it's physical tells, whether it's tendencies, whether guys like calling off too light, whether guys bluffing too light, and also creating this sort of uh, intimidation factor, like, uh, you know, when people play against him and then using that to just really like, you know, mash people. Yeah. And, and he's just so good at that. Like one of the, he didn't, when he was crushing online, you know, back in the day too. That wasn't because he was using any sort of computer programs. He was paying attention to the flow of the game and how people were playing and figured out stuff that, oh, okay, if I check raise. I remember someone showing heads up back then. Uh, he was check raising 20% of flops. Nobody else was check raising more than five or like six, maybe. He was check raising 20%, right? He just came to that intuitively because he's like, all right, this is going to work because people are C-betting too much so I can put the pressure on him. He figures stuff out organically. And he does it a lot of time with experimentation where he'll try new things. I remember a couple of years ago at a super high roller bowl, his sizes were like really strange. And I talked to him about it. I was like, yeah, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go big there. He's like, I'm working on something. I'm like, okay. Hey buddy, if you're working on something, you know, you're working, you're working on something. Like he was, there was these spots where he was betting big size on flops that, you know, standard is small. And I was like, okay, I see you. I see you. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm a believer that obviously when you play online, it's a different animal today. Right. Playing as close to GTO as you possibly can is probably going to win you the most money. But live poker, I don't think that's ever going to get there. So because of that, until until otherwise, you know, notified, I'm, I feel Ivy's like been my goat for many years, and he's and he is now that he's got his head on straight. I'm I'm actually like super glad you brought up the online thing because I'd almost forgotten that he was like a crusher online. But I I was back. I mean, I was backing, but I had pieces of Matt Harvalenko, and Matt Harvalenko was considered to be the best limit hold'em player in the world. He played Phil heads up thousand, 2000 and he quit Phil. Yeah. You know, like we, you know, we thought we were going to be a favorite going in. Oh, it's like Phil Ivy. He plays all the game, but whatever, like, but Matt, this is what Matt does all day all along. Matt was like, maybe I can beat him, but like so far he's been crushing me and I don't feel like I can, I, I don't feel like right now I can beat him. You know, it's funny. You said, so all the heads up matches that he played, the vast majority of the matches that he played, the person he was playing got ahead. Good. Mm-hmm. He was stuck in all the matches almost always until boom. He figured them out. Like, that's the thing. Once he's got you pegged on what you're going to do, and if you can't get out of, of those patterns and stuff like that, that's when all of a sudden he kicks it into overdrive and he would beat people that are... Because the thing is, at the beginning of a match, he's going to be fundamentally inferior to people who study. Yeah. He just is, right? So yeah. how's he going to win? He's going to win by, you know, not playing fundamentally ABC. He's going to figure out ways to exploit. Always. Do you think he's run a solver? Does he think in ter- terms of GTO ever, or is he just thinking hit the way he plays and his intuition? Well, he's you know he thinks about the game on a, at a high level, right? He's not he's not he's not he never. I'll tell you what he's never going to do. <laughs> he's never going to let the roll of a dice make a decision. 
which is something you see like it's so stupid it's so incredibly stupid and i know i dabbled with it i was learning and stuff like that i went through my phase but like imagine playing in a live tournament right and you're in a spot on the river where you think you should bluff about 30 percent of the time okay and instead of actually deciding is this a spot i should you just roll a dice and go what I said, do it. I'm going to do it rather than a lot, rather than actually put this one hand in a vacuum, this one spot right here. Think about the history. What do they think of me? Are they going to overfold? Are they going to underfold? What is better for my tournament now? Long term is, you know, is, is having, is maintaining this chip stack worth more than, you know, it is to play, but balance and all this kind of stuff. Like you're telling me that you, you're going to take a poker mind, right? That is going to really be good at that and just devolve it into rolling dice. Rolling dice in live tournaments is for people that are not good enough to make better decisions than the dice roll, right? It's those that are like, oh, I have to protect from being exploited, right? You know, in spots where, you know, and it's also learning the game that way. It's kind of easier in a way because you're really not making any decisions. You're just memorizing stuff. You're like, oh, oh, this spot. Yep. I need to see about this flop 65% of the time. All right. So I'll randomize and I'll do that instead of game flow and all that kind of stuff, which... I don't think you'd ever see, and I'll, you're never, you're not going to see me do that. I'm not going to be like, I'm just going to say the best. Cause here, here's what I would say. One, one last thing on this thing. Yeah. I, this is generally good advice for you guys. If you play live tournaments or whatever, if you want to solve and the solve says do something 80% and another thing, 20%, it's because the 80% thing is better, right? The only reason the computer tells you to do the 20% sometimes is to balance, right? It is giving you the inferior option. So if you always did, the 80 and never did the 20. Obviously, in the long term, you know, your players will start to adjust to that. But in one vacuum spot, if the solver says 80, 20, just do the 80. Always. I had a, had a friend bust the main event this year on coin flips. Guys, he made a big, my friend makes a big bluff in the end. The guy says, thinks about it, thinks for three minutes, tanks, can't come to a decision, says, if I'm going to flip two coins. If, they, if it comes heads, heads, I'm going to call. Came heads, heads. Guy calls, turns over a buff. It's good, but I mean, I you know, I told my friend like that's kind of like a win for you in a way. Like you know, he, it's just like the guy the guy thought that that you're gonna have it more often than not, and he just convinced himself that that if it came twenty this twenty five percent is it a win though? He's in the that, tournament. So. Is it really a win? He's he went home. I don't know. It's like you know, <laughs> that's what Doug Polk did in the uh, in the million dollar yeah. game. Did he? Yeah. He was yeah, facing he, uh, he was facing a spot with pocket aces where. He could essentially only beat a bluff, and he randomized the cards and then said, you know, if he hit spade, spade, or something like that, that he would call. So he was basically decided he was calling 25% of the time, which is about right. Like, actually, somebody did the solve later, and it was about 26%. Is correct. <laughs> it's pretty sick that he, that he got <laughs> that close. So yeah. he was dead on and playing optimally, right? But then, you know, then you factor in, like, if Phil Ivey was in that spot, that's not how he would make his decision. You know, Phil, I Phil Ivey would look at the man and, you know, watch how he played the hand throughout, get a sense of his energy, and, uh, and then I'll, like make that. And I just think in the long run, right? Obviously, if you do 25%, you'll be fine. But I think that Ivy and the really best the elite players can do better than that by actually just making the decision in the moment. It's like, what real other information do I have, basically? I was just looking up if there was any record of... Because of, Victor Blom plays that same style where he kind of figures you out. And it looks like Ivy beat him up pretty good. I think he beat him you know up for like Victor did? Oh, four or five on million. Because I had to play a match years ago against Victor Blom, and the first time he beat me pretty good, and the second time I won very small. So we, we broke even, but I lost money. And I remember asking him later, just to think, just to show you like how his brain works and how he thinks. I was three betting him, like you know, as as you should. He never four bet me. He four bet me one time in like a thousand hands or whatever. And then later, you know, we became friendly and I asked him. I was like, "How come you never four bet?" And you know what he said? Because I didn't want you to stop three betting. <laughs> because he liked the situation of being in position against three bets. So if he starts to four bet, he would assume that my frequency is going to go down. And he doesn't want me to. So, you know, even if he had aces or something, he's just like, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's going to trap me with those hands. So, so that was, that's completely exploitative. He probably noticed that in three bet pots, I was probably out of position. I was probably playing, making a lot of mistakes. So he's like, all right, I'm just never going to four bet you. I'm just like, you know, play more of these spots because I haven't been. Is Victor allowed back in Paradise Island? Is is he going to be at? Uh, <laughs> is he going to be at the World Series of Poker in Paradise? Good I don't know. But yeah, that incident was. Something. I don't know. Has <laughs> it ever been come out to a, the rumor? Or... 
I mean, it wasn't stars that banned him. It was the Atlantis. So well, you know what happened? Yeah. There was a tray of food, and they put something in the food that wasn't food. It was not food. No, it wasn't it was food. Not. He shit in a plate. Okay. He <laughs> <laughs> and all of his friends shit in a plate. But, I mean, what the heck? And two poker players, one <laughs> plate, is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, so, so we, we, you've mentioned the FOMO, Daniel. Uh, I don't think there's another Triton series this year. At least I can't find one. Um, are you going to be off to uh, to a Triton series uh, next year in 2024? Yeah, maybe next year because this year actually, you know, I'm not a big traveler, but I will be doing some traveling. I'm coming to your neck of the woods, gentlemen. I'm coming to your neck of the woods. I'm coming to Vancouver. We decided because I'm going to be coming for about two weeks of the GG Online Poker Series. Um, I sort of mapped out a couple weeks that make sense. Um we we'll be staying, you know, we could have went to Cabo. I just felt like, you know, she's never really been. She kind of wanted to see it. I felt like it's kind of easier. Like, I would have went to Toronto, right? Because she's never been there. But now Gigi's been fenced in, you know, the world series, it's fenced in there. So, you, you know, it doesn't work. So I had to figure out another place. It was either Mexico, Vancouver. We're going to decide on Vancouver. So we look forward to that. Then I'll be back here for the Poker Masters. There's a couple series, a mixed game series, a PLO series. I'll play in Vegas. And then, of course, 100% going to... WSOP Paradise for the entirety of that. Um, and I think the Super High Roller Bowl got announced again. That's after the Poker Masters. I want to defend my title there. So I won't be going any to any Tritons in 2023, but 2024, I'm going to look and see what makes the most sense. Because, yeah, I definitely get a lot of FOMO. The tournament the fields, you know, they're unbelievable. I tell you what, though. The structures are bad. Like, yeah. The structures are not good. Like, the structures we use at the, at the studio, Poker Go Studio, 10 times better. Like ten times, and is that because they're catering to the the VIP players? No, nah, I don't think they are. I I, I mean, uh, maybe a little bit because obviously having more of a crapshoot gives them a better chance. But the problem with them is simply this: like what Carrie figured out a long time ago in the old structures is when you start with three hundred big blinds deep, you're going to end up with a crapshoot if you're trying to do it in two days, right? So what we do at the studio is we start with about one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred and fifty days ish, like depending on you know the buy. So you're already in it right off the bat. And now you can just proceed, you know, with 40 minute levels and it stays, you know, decent the whole way. And obviously, you know, the blinds get up there by the final table, but watching a lot of the Tritons, I mean, you're seeing a lot of spots with like six left and, you know, five of the guys have 11 or less big blinds. And the chip leader has like 31. Uh, all right. So you mentioned it, Daniel, the uh, GG online world series of poker is approaching. Um, it is, what are the dates here? Uh, August 20th to October 2nd, so right around the corner, uh, six days away. Uh, it starts off with a $109 uh, bankroll, bankroll bounty builder, builder bounty, something like that. It's <laughs> <laughs> a tongue twister. Uh, bankroll builder bounty, no limit hold'em, $108. Continental free roll, 100000 I wanted to ask you about these continental free rolls. So I think from what I understand is uh, if the winner of this tournament is on your continent, uh, of the four different continents that are uh, that are mapped out, and you played in the event, you qualify for a hundred thousand dollar free roll, which is pretty cool to have that kind of a overlay there. Yeah, it's kind of a fun way to sort of create a rooting interest, right? So we've got the North America. Like, obviously, if you bust the tournament, now you can sweat it and root for you know one of your people, because anyone who enters the tournament is going to be eligible for that. I think it's kind of fun. The other, there's a couple twists. Um, one other one, the Millie Maker, that I think you, you notice in the structure, it says like final hundred, right? So that's actually, you're going to be able to qualify that for that on G, in the GG series now, that's coming up, the online series. You play the Millie Maker, you make the final hundred, you play that out in Bahamas. So it's going to play out live. So it's a little bit of a hybrid where you're, you know, you start the tournament playing online and then you finish it the last hundred live in the Bahamas. And you get a package, you get to go down there, airfare, hotel, the whole bit, right? I looked online. Yeah, and, like, yeah. yeah I was looking online mm -hmm. for the World Series of Poker Paradise and staying at the Cove for 300 bucks US a night. Like there's some good deals there for, I think you got to play for, you got to be there for 11 days. But um, for anybody who hasn't been down there for, uh, you know, the old Poker Stars events, yeah, it's an expensive place, but there that's a good deal. And and you know, it's a ton of fun. You're gonna have a great time if you've never been, for sure. So a couple things on that, just just so people are clear. You're gonna have to book rooms because like a lot of people say, hey, the rooms are sold out or whatever. You're gonna have to book them through GG because we blocked off a bunch of rooms. And secondarily, we talked about this, I think, on the last part, I'm not sure, but like if you are traveling, you play the series, don't if you can at all avoid it, which you should be able to, 
don't bring cash. Just come and play, like send a wire to the casino. I believe, I believe that there will be options to use your, your GG Poker account. I believe there will be Luxon Pay crypto options. So the number of ways in which you can get money there are pretty endless. And there's just no reason to like have to carry like, you know, $15,000, $20,000 in cash over borders. You shouldn't really do that. Frankly, you shouldn't do that in any country, you know, in any part of the world. There's just no reason for it anymore. You know, most of the ways in which we can send money are uh, digital. So find a way to do that. Plan ahead. Uh, all right. And you won't need money when you're there. You just use a credit card and you, know, you use your bank, whatever. Looking over the series, you're going to come up for the Event 8, the Limit Hold'em Championship. I'm sure, Terrence, you're going to kick, uh, get into their $2,500 buy-in. Um, lots. Otherwise known as the Where's the Slider event. How come I can't? How come I can only raise toys to the big blind? What's going on? I, I can only bet one sixth of the pot. What's, where's under, the antes? Over under Terrence, Adam, uh, Ross. Over under the number of players who enter the 2,500 Limit Hold'em who enter it and go, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know this was limited. It's like 10% at least, maybe yeah. more. It's Because it's really buried in there. I Like, yeah, like I, there's these guys, there's four guys in the lobby on the staking platform that are currently selling action for themselves. And I'm like, I'm tempted just to buy their action because at least I'm sure they know which tournament they're playing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if they're any good or not, but at least they know what tournament they're playing. Lots of things up to a um, uh, $25,000 um a high roller event. Uh, Danny, how long are you going to stay up here and play in these events? Yeah, my 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 current plan is to be there on the leave on the 28th and then play the limit hold'em first event on the on the 29th. Stay there through the 13th, which I believe allows me to play the 5K short deck, two of uh, Terrence's favorite games here. Um, and then you know, and then and then leave town um, so I can come back and play the Masters. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I will be streaming for those that uh, are wondering. I'm. I got a monitor. Ross is going to take care of that for me. Christian sent him a monitor. We're going to get set up uh, at the hotel. I'm not going to get a house. My man really loves hotel living. It's like so much more comfortable for her. Um, hopefully, they'll get me a fridge, this fancy schmancy hotel, and I can uh, have some stuff in there. But yeah, the plan is to have a monitor there, bring some of the equipment I need, and we're going to do streams like we did uh, while I was in Cabo. And you're going to stream, you're going to we'll stream think- at the uh, Paradise Island as well, right? Or are you going to do vlogs? Well, I'll be doing vlog. So yeah, at the at WSOP in Paradise, we're going to do the vlog again. Right. So that'll be the daily vlog where, um, yeah, just just kind of like what we do in the summer, but a different vibe because obviously, you know, Bahamas. You're gonna have to go down water. So you're gonna have to get a, a waterproof camera so you can go down the water slides and and hold it, go through the shark there, have a lot of fun. It, hopefully, not, remember back in the day. I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, I can't remember who it was. The online guys. There's a shark, right? There's a there's a water slide that goes underneath a shark tank and somebody offered somebody five grand to go swimming in the shark tank and, and jump in and swim to the other side or something. I think that was another person who got banned from the Atlantis, but yeah, I remember that brought that very well. I'm pretty sure they, they also, and they survived, which was good. Otherwise we would remember it even more. Um, uh, all right. Uh, moving on. Can I say one thing about the, the the GG series that I didn't know, which is pretty cool. So when I went, and of course I just looked at the 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 Limit Hold'em event as I would, I didn't know about this, Daniel. That you get bonus chips for starting on time. Not I don't know if this is every tournament, but yeah, it says like if you start on time, you get ten percent bonus chips, and if you start at level one, you get like five percent bonus chips. This is such a cool idea. I have not start started an internet poker tournament online in fucking god knows how long. I have not played from the starting bell in a very long time, but if they're going to give me 10% more chips, then I guess I have to. Well, that's the thing, right? Because a lot of the times, especially, you know, with live, you know, let's say, for example, yeah. if you have live high rollers that, that you're expecting about 50 to 80 players, right? Well, if you didn't have some sort of incentive, people come on time, then you end up with four or five people show up. It kind of like seems kind of like, yeah. so yeah. So basically it's rewarding those people that, you know, want to play from the start. And, uh, and I, you know, that, that guarantees that like, you already have the critical, like not everybody's just waiting to see who else is going to come, you know? Yeah. So, I thought that was a cool idea. Never, because it used to be, it used to be bubble protection, right? Like that's what, I don't know if GG still has a bubble protection thing. That that was a cool idea. So now they're going with just like, you know what? Just to give you extra trips. It's kind of like pretty cool. Uh, we did talk about it. The World Series of Poker Paradise. Uh, again, just to f- clarify the schedule, December 3rd to the 14th, uh, 15 events, two online. Um, so uh, not, you know, 50 million guaranteed, tons of no limit hold them, 50, uh, mentioned at 15 bracelets. 
Um, I would imagine I, I looked on Club GG, Daniel. That's probably coming with a with a way to win uh, your way into some of the tournaments there. Well, I haven't looked there. I, I do know that you know on GG Poker itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, there'd be a lot of ways. I'm going to send a lot of qualifiers for the main event. And for the yeah, get your way in uh, over at GG Poker. Um, not a lot of mixed games. Uh, I noticed some people on Twitter saying, well, that kind of made uh, my decision for just the, you know, obviously the mixed game players are a smaller uh, portion of the uh, poker playing community. And, and, you know, you have limited time down there. So I'm guessing that was, you know, part of the decision on GG's part. Well, so I'll tell you what it is. So I obviously would have loved to have at least one eight game, right? Like, and I was kind of pushing, saying maybe we should have, like, at least one, right? You know, obviously, I understand, you know, it's not going to be a robust one. Here's the thing with mixed games, right? And I love them, and I would love them to be part of every series. But you have to think regionally where you are, right? When you're in Las Vegas, mixed games, that's the hotbed, right? People are going to play, like, mixed game players are Vegas-based. That is generally, speaking. like, obviously, there's some East Coast players, but, like, you run tournaments that are mixed, they're going to do really well in Vegas. So, when you think of kind of the target or the type of audience that you're going to get, you know, in paradise, you're going to have a lot of qualifiers from online. You're going to have a lot of South Americans. Some of them play mixed, sure. Um, you'll have a lot of the Asian players, um, you know, the Triton, Triton group, stuff like that. You'll have some of the Canadians and whatnot. So I think also, um, you know, just from a competitive standpoint, it's probably for just like, there's only so many events they could have. They wanted to have just, you know, no limit PLO, the more popular versions. Um, again, for me personally, I I would always have at least one mixed game. But you know, I already, I mean, I know it wouldn't draw well, right? It's not, it's not a, it's not like oh, what? So then you have to ask yourself, right? If you only have fifteen events, right? You could have hundreds, if not thousands, of players in them, versus one that's going to have like a hundred if you're lucky, right? It's just different, you know. It's it's like if you were going to have a, an entire series at the, the World Series of Poker, obviously they make sense going in there. But for destination international events. It probably makes more sense to just have the more popular versions available. Well, and if you have one mixed game event, one eight game, it's not like you're going to draw a bunch of the mixed game players for one tournament, right? So exactly. you got to have a full yeah. suite of them, and then that takes up a bunch of your time, dealers, uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's it's sort of you're stuck to to be able to offer a full suite. It, it doesn't seem to work at that point. Yeah. No, of course. So like I think that you know mixed game World Series of Poker, that's a Las Vegas thing. And then when you see WSOP events, whether it's in Rosbadov or, you know, whether they're going to be online or whether they're going to be uh, you know, any international, you're just not going to see mixed as much. I think WSOP Europe used to have mixed games and then they just weren't very well attended. They yeah. had, yeah, like, you know, they tried to run one with a very modest guarantee and it was just not well attended, you know, like it's just not that popular um, comparatively. But the World Series poker, the, you know, in the summer is very special because you have a robust schedule of mixed events. And then, of course, well, it's also like a, an issue of dealer training too. In the pla in the place like the Bahamas, they have been dealing no limit hold'em and dealing PLO is not very hard either by comparison. But yeah, like dealing, but you teach these these, these trying to explain locally, them, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Local dealers are gonna have a lot of a lot of trouble with the non flop games. Uh, all right, moving on, Daniel. You are uh, out for a walk with your dogs last week, and some guy rolls up on you, and he's like, a kid, some, some kid, kid rolls up on you, and he's like, hey, dude. Uh, me and my boys were having one last poker game before uh, we head off to college. What are the chances that you would come by? You got to love the kid shooting a shot, right? Like he's out driving, sees Daniel walking down the street with the pups and just decides, you know what? I'm going to pull over and ask the guy. Is that kind of how it went down? Something like that. So, yeah, I was just walking the dogs, as you said, and then I see this kid get out of his car and he's going – but then he walks, he's walking up to me and he's wearing a suit. Looks like you know, almost Mormon, right? White, white shirt. I'm like, okay, what is he going to sell me? A Bible, right? Um, <laughs> and then he's like, he, he says, he says it this way. He says, um, can I have a couple minutes of your time? Oh, he's got the watchtower in his hand. Then, he, as, if he says that. He's, he's definitely selling new Bibles at that point. When you can say I have that? a couple minutes of, his, of your time. And then he says, you know, he, like you said, he said, um, my buddies and I are going off to college. And we're, tonight there's going to be a whole bunch of kids here wearing suits playing our last game before we all go off. And, you know, we just, I would just like, I would totally understand if you say no, but it'd be great if you would, uh, if you could just stop by for a minute. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is, I don't know, whatever, right? I don't know this kid or whatever like that. So um, I say, we'll see, right? We'll see. I go home, I put a Twitter poll up, you know? So would you go if you were me? And it was obviously people are like, you go, 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 go. I asked Amanda, she's like, yeah, you should totally go. So I said, all right. Then I'm thinking about it. And all of a sudden I see Amanda sends me that they tweeted at me. 
And there's like 10 of them going like this. <laughs> Please come, right? And they're all in suits. And I'm like, oh my God. So I say, all right, I'm going to do this right. Um, Amanda counted them. There's 10 kids. So I brought, I went to my stash. I bought a bunch of hoodies, some GG hoodies, hooker goes, some all kinds of stuff. I brought a basket of hoodies. And as you can see in the video, like this was, this made me feel good. Sometimes you bring shit and people are like, I don't want this. They were like, all in, you know, they were super into getting the hoodies and stuff like that. And they were all like super excited, you know, uh, to meet me or whatever. And I said, okay, let's play with them for a little bit. So I decided I was going to sit in on the game, you know, play with them. And this kid, these kids, okay. These are not your, I couldn't believe it. Right. Someone asked me, do you have anything in common with these kids? I said, no, not at all. These kids are, I'm, let me, let me just, these kids, first of all, they're all wearing suit and ties. They're playing poker, drinking water. Okay. What? And listening to classical music, classical music, right? Yeah. <laughs> classical music. And I'm thinking, then I, then I decide, cause like I'm listening to what these guys do and where they're going. I'm like, holy shit. So I go around the table and ask these guys where they're going. All these Ivy league schools. Finance, biochemical engineers, like all this stuff I have. No, I, can't, I can't, don't even understand, right? I asked this one kid, he's in finance. He says he's doing the finances for a hotel in Israel and also doing the Durango's finances. And I'm like, they trust you to do that? He's like, it's just a spreadsheet. It's easy. I'm like, but you're 17 years old, right? <laughs> this, was an, this was like a really impressive group of kids. It made me feel like, I mean, I never experienced anything like that. I mean, you don't live in a poor neighborhood. They're going to be, they're going to be well-educated kids. Right, exactly. You know, you're talking like, <laughs> all the Ivy league schools, you can watch the video if you want to see, but like, but yeah, so this was like, I didn't have that experience in school. Like I didn't quite finish high school. I never went to college. My friends were not all on their way to Ivy league schools. So it was just really neat to like, you know, see how respect they were so respectful. It was like beyond, they asked a lot of questions. I'm going to give you a quick. So they asked about two poker players. Which two do you think they asked about? Uh, oh. Or three. They asked about three, three, the third one's a little. So they're going to be smart. So, so Ivy, Ivy is one. Ivy is the question one. is, is Doyle one of them? I guess Ivy is the question. Ivy was one. Helmuth. Helmuth is two. The third one's going to be a little trickier for you. He's not really around these days. He's, he's really okay, you said he because really I was going to guess a girl poker player. Okay, so I'm thinking okay. like super intelligent, like Huff. No, it was a guy who was funny. He had a sidekick. He did a po- he did a show once or twice. Funny had a sidekick. Um. Oh, Unabomber. There you go, Phil Locke. That's the other one they were asking about. I was I was happy, I was I was hoping you weren't gonna say Dan Bilzerian because that was what I was gonna guess no. next. My next guess was Danny Dan Bilzerian. Guys, if they seen rounders, none of them Wow. Them. I said you gotta watch. Wow. 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 These kids don't watch You gotta TV. turn off the classical music right there and fire up Netflix the kids, on the spot. They don't watch TV. I asked them about shows, they're like, we don't really watch TV. I'm like, I guess not, <laughs> since you guys are studying all the time. So I was blown away by it. And then of course I I documented it, you know, I was taking videos and stuff like that. And here's the thing that didn't, it surprised me a little bit. I, I expected the response from like Twitter to be positive, right? I didn't expect what I got. I genuinely didn't. It was overwhelmingly positive. Like everyone was like, good on you for doing that, you know, for taking the time. It was like one of those feel good poker stories yeah. that, um, you know, is rare. Like it was unanimous except for literally just one person. There's only one person. Well, who was it? Who was it? <laughs> Norman Chad, because he's not a good human being, in my opinion. <laughs> really. I just think the guy's like a bad human being. Like, he decided to take his time to make a joke of it and talk, you know, and sort of, like, if you read his tweet, I someone sent it to me. I was like, okay, I'm not surprised. So literally one hater, and that's the expected one. But aside from that, you know, it was really cool. I think I, uh, I connected with the kids in a good way, maybe give them some memories they go off to college with, and they've always got a story to tell. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. It made me think of, like, doing that sort of stuff more often. Because yeah. I think like one of the ways to grow poker is like some of that grassroots stuff where you just like, and then like, none of these, ever, ever someone asked me like, is there any, is the next Daniel Negreanu in that room? No, no, these kids are going to do much bigger and better things than I am. None of them were good <laughs> poker players. They were not like, you know, they weren't good, but uh, I won every fucking hand too. <laughs> <laughs> what do you play like 25 cent, 50 cent, right? You play 25 cent, 50 cent. I bought it for 50 bucks. I think I won about 60 or so. And of course, I wasn't going to take the kids' money, so I uh, I told them to throw the sixty bucks in. I told them how to do it. I said, put five bucks in each pot for the next until they're out, right? And that way, you have little bomb pot action. Um, and they had a blast. And they, you know, I signed cards and took pictures and the whole spiel. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it felt good. I'll say this, like at the risk of embarrassing you, like you know, I know you don't like the the term ambassador, but that's exactly what poker ambassador. You know, that's that kind of thing. Those kids are never for, going to forget it, right? It's just a great experience for them. And that's, you know, that's why, you know, you know, you are that ambassador for poker and it's great to see it. And, uh, 
it was a feel good story. And like you said, only Norman Chad can, can turn that into a shitty story. That's amazing. Wow. That he could do that. But, uh, yeah, he mocked it and called it. I, I had to look up the word because he used the word "legress," something like that. Legress. Yeah. You know what that word nope. means? I forgot now already. No. Le- the legress. I got to find the tweet. I'm just looking it up. Uh, but speaking of neighborhoods, Daniel, moving on. Um, you know, you're you've been sort of in the same house for a while. I know you've had some problems and some. Oh, okay. I figured it out. Okay, so legress, largress, generosity in bestowing money or gifts upon others. Oh, largess. Large ass. Large yeah, ass. I don't fucking know. I don't, like I said, I didn't go to you, you didn't go to a fancy school. The kids would have known the word. The kids would have known. Yes. Large, <laughs> large, large, large. I don't fucking know. Bro. Uh, <laughs> I know uh, Jack Ray. Your neighborhood. So you're, you're, you know, I saw some tweets that you're out looking for a house and, and Lake Las Vegas. Wow. I didn't, I did not have uh, Daniel moving to Lake Las Vegas. I'm a bit. All the way to the other end of Vegas. Very serious about this one. Very, very serious. Working on it. Hope to do it this week. Um, so the thinking is this, right? Even even though everybody on the internet now has immediately exposed it, because you posted one picture up there, and of course the internet is undefeated yeah. in finding out what it wants to find. find so it. you posted one picture of the house, everybody knows where you live now. They'll find it. Anyway. <laughs> so here's the deal, right? This house that I live in right now, I love this house. It is laid out exactly perfect. The kitchen's right in front of me. I've got the gaming area here, pool table, big wide open TV. I got a big pool. I got a nice little sitting area, and I got a golf green, you know, and I got a golf simulator upstairs. I got like everything I could want for the quote unquote bachelor pad type thing. Right. But the thing is me and Amanda, we've been married for four years or something like that. And I think this is common for people when you get married, if you move into somebody's house, right? Like it's still my place. It's not hers. You know what I mean? And I think there's like an, a natural evolution in the step where we move into something together that we both love. And now it's really ours and she can feel like it's hers as well. And the real big selling point for her, the most important aspect of it is it being on the water. Like that makes her feel serenity, calm, you know, just makes her much happier. Right. So, um, and we went to the area, it's this cute little village. It's like not, it's pretty dead out there right now for a lot of different reasons. But the thing is too, for what I'm, what I can pay for that house, if I got that same house in the ridges or somewhere or whatever, it would be worth, it would cost at least double. Right now, what's the drawbacks of living there? It's going to be a little bit farther. Right. So now my drive to the world series about 17, 18 minutes, you know, maybe 25 with traffic. This one's going to be closer to 40, 45. And all that means is I'm just going to get a room when I play. And then on nights where I make a day two, I'm going to stay there. And she's cool with that. We already started looking at the back. I'm going to build the gym in the back. We've got, we've got a lot of ideas for what we want to do to make the place cool. Um, but I'm hopeful we can get it. Um, I have to put my ducks in a row to make it happen. But uh, hopefully that happens this week and we, and we don't lose. How does the negotiations go uh, with, with you guys? Is it like, how much do you want? Okay, we'll buy it. Or no, we're going to kind of come in at this number. So Christian, who's an all around athlete, by the way, Christian, who you, you know, you know, Ross, I know, Christian started as my golf coach, right? That was it. Then he started running. He was, oh, he's still my golf guy. And my golf caddy and everything. Then he started running poker VT. You know, then he started do, like doing whatever. Then, then he started uh, doing all my social media. You know? <laughs> and he does all my computer stuff and all my streaming stuff all the blog stuff and he's also got a real estate license now so <laughs> but yeah so he uh yeah so he's uh i i leave him in charge you know obviously i have trust in him to you know make good decisions because i'm an idiot with that stuff like i'm there and i'm talking to the agent and i'm just like oh my god this place is awesome and my wife's like you're making this way too easy for her you know what i mean like but it's fine it's good. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I don't. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not playing the, the law. Like, oh, I don't. We watch these shows. I don't know if you ever watch some of these trashy shows, but Amanda got me into it. Selling Sunset. Yeah. You haven't yeah, heard of it? Sure. So it's beautiful. Beautiful homes. Yeah. Beautiful fashion. Caddy women, just awful to each other, kind of stuff, right? Um, and uh, part of what I notice in these shows that blows my mind is like someone will be trying to buy a house that's listed for like six point four million, right? And they're like. 6.25 is all I'll do. And then the person comes back with 6.325. I'm like, you guys are really going to buy a $6 million hog and you're haggling over fifty to 100000 Like, I just, I've never been that guy. You know, I've never been that person that, that bargains or, or does that. So when they do, it's like, you know. I mean, I mean, in fairness, you know, you play a, if you play like a 25K tournament, you know, no decision you make on day one is even going to be worth $100,000. Right. So, but imagine, imagine you're at the end of, of day one of a 25 K 
and you just decide, you know what? I'm bored. I'm just going to rip it in right. with the old three you thought. I get it. Like, <laughs> it's still 100K is 100K, right? I get it from a pure mathematical perspective. But then when I think about like, unless you're doing it for flipping reasons, right? Like you're buying this house because you want to live yeah. there. If you're like buying this house because you want to live there, like it, it won't change your life if it's, you know, you pay 6.25 or 6.4. Or, like you're probably going to finance it anyway. So it's like, it's not that big a deal. But then like, are you really like take it or leave it? Like really? It's all, It's like that old thing where like, you know, Adam, how much for you to eat a piece of my, my dog's shit? Oh. Right? How much would you do it for? 100,000? <laughs> like a small 100,000. 100, so you say 100,000, right? Now, if I put 98,000 in front of you, what are you going to do? <laughs> Throw up and eat it? <laughs> yeah. So then you'd probably do it for 94,000, too. You know what I'm saying? It's like everyone <laughs> says, that's my take or leave it. And that line is always bullshit if the cash is in front of you. Everyone says, oh, I wouldn't do it for less than 200,000. Okay. Put 142 on there in the table and see what they do. <laughs> Not that I would, like that's something Bill Perkins could do for fun. You know what I mean? Because he's got so much money. I haven't eaten dinner yet. Now I don't think I'm going to eat dinner, actually, probably yeah. <laughs> at this point. I mean, I mean, I think some people consider it part of the game, right? Like, like the same way that we consider poker make part of the game. Let's just make good decisions. I've got this hand. This is the best way to play this hand. I want to make this decision the right way. I think some people just go into their life negotiations well, like that. I get it. I just, I can't imagine like anyone who really wanted a house would like yeah. walk away because yeah. of seventy five k at a six point four. I get the negotiation part. You know, you right. applying the pressure, and maybe that's fun, like you said. Like it is fun. Like why I always, cause I don't relate to billionaires either. Like I can't, I don't get it, you know, but for them, the enjoyment they get is making good deals where they get the yeah. best of it. Like that's kind of fun for them. Cause like, I'm like, you have a billion dollars and you're worried. You just, you're super excited. You just made a deal for 20 million. Like who gives a shit? Like, you know, I don't, I just don't, I, I just can't relate. That's funny, right? I so I don't know. I and mean, we're going to talk about this in a sec, but we might as well talk about it now. Uh, high stakes poker season 11 uh, uh, episode one just drops and, JRB and Rick Solomon, Robel, um, are, are in the game. And uh, Solomon says to JRB, how much would it take? No, he says, if I offer you $100 million to never, to, here's $100 million, but you can never gamble again, would you take it? And JRB goes, fuck, no, not a chance. Like, it, so that's the thing, right? It's, it's sort of that, that similar thing. Like, you, do? you just, you, everybody has kind of a number, and, and there is no number for JRB that you can offer him. He's like, well, what would I do with a hundred million? Buy a yacht and sit on it? Like that's not, he, he... I kind of feel the same way. I mean, it's real, it, it seems ridiculous, but I kind of feel the same way. Like gambling is such a part of my life and I have fun and I, I want to gamble with my friends over the check. I want to gamble over, uh, this guy will cross the street faster than the other guy. Like, it's just kind of fun to do it. I tell Gambling's you what though, I, I, giving it, coming at it from a different angle, there comes a point where you're morally irresponsible for saying no. Right. So imagine sure. this, imagine yeah. someone says, I'll give you like, five billion dollars and you just can't gamble anymore right now you being like somebody with good moral character or whatever you have ideas i'm sure that you want to see better in the world right like you saying no to that money is essentially saying no to all the people you could have helped with that making so much of a difference you make over being you know because you want to gamble right so but the but the problem is if you even if you're worth five billion dollars like bill gates is running this problem like you can ask dan we can have dan smith on and talk about it it's not so easy to give away money i can be like i want the the thing i want to stop is hunger in africa okay i've got five billion dollars i want to stop hunger in africa and the thing is i can't just give five billion dollars i'm not talking specifically about just giving it away i'm talking about creating right so yeah. like you're like okay you're going to go to improvised areas you're going to build schools you know, you're going to, you're going to upgrade the, you know, the just impoverished third world countries. You can like, there's so much you could do where you actually create rather than, like you said, I agree writing a check. I don't emotionally connect to that either. You know, when it comes to stuff like that, but actually being a part of it, creating it from, you know, the ground up, creating a foundation, whatever the case may be, there's just a lot of good you can do. So there be, there comes a point where I think there's like a moral question of like, but, but I guess where, where's the 5 billion coming from, right? Like who, who's give, who's on the other end of this transaction, right? It's somebody else who could have done the same thing with the five billion dollars. Of course, you know? I mean, obviously, yeah. You, you know, you look, but let's say they worked. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> is, you know, like obviously, if they're just going to give you five billion dollars. They're not morally responsible. Like, right? Exactly. I will, and partly because I wouldn't know what to do with the money. Right? I'd have to, I'd have to go and like consult all these people and be like, "What's the best delegation of five billion dollars?" I got no idea. I donate like a few thousand dollars to hospitals here and there because I think they're good hospitals. Like I got, I got no concept of how to deal with like all those zeros. I personally, no I would start grassroots. 
I would start yeah. my own community. I'm serious. As small as that sounds, I would go to like. But you can't spend five billion dollars in your community. I won't be spending. You, not you, you could spend a hundred thousand, maybe. I, where I would start, I would start at the worst parts of the city, right? Yeah. Downtown Las Vegas. People are struggling. Everyone's got. A, I would build a drug rehabilitation center there. I would build an epic homeless center to start there, right? And then so like. You know, you start there and then you grow from that perspective and you try to change lives that way. One, you know, one life at a time. That That's what speaks to me. That might not be the most, like, I know there's like effective altruism and stuff. That's probably not it, what I'm talking about. There's more effective ways to do that. But it was, it's how I feel good about giving. Nice. All right. Uh, quickly mention it. I say Spoker Season 11 as uh, first episode has dropped. Second episode, I believe, is out today. Uh, fantastic lineup. They're playing 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, mandatory 4,000 straddle i think every, you know there's probably six five or six million on the table for sure but it's often one two four eight sixteen like there's five straddles it's it's crazy action it's fun to watch and uh and aj and uh nick shulman are doing a great job if you if you like those two guys uh i watched the first episode it was great because you know they know when to be quiet nick and, and aj are both really good at it and they can sense when there's a story being told not to jump in and, and talk over it. And there's some great GRB stories and, and Rob Young is also there. He tells some good stories. So, so check that out. Daniel, are you, I, I haven't looked at the lineup for the rest of the season. Did you get your nose? In there? I don't think I played. I don't remember. I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. So, uh, but check that out. Poker Go obviously carries, carries those and you can, uh, you know, sign up for 10 bucks a month or whatever it is. You can see the whole backlog as well. Um, speaking of, uh, poker, uh, streaming and on television, um, and end of commentators who get <laughs> this, sorry. I just when you were talking about this, I was just thinking of of the lady who's on the stream going, "Okay, oh, let's boy, go to the chip the best, One of the best moments of the year. It was I. I was appalled and then laughing my head off within five seconds. So what Terrence is referring to is there's a poker stream called the Big Bet Poker Stream. Um, I believe it's an offshoot of the Live at the Bike, um, and it's filmed at the Tropicana in Las Vegas. And you know, there's a lot of streams out there trying to gain some traction. It's a cash game. And, you know, we get this, be as crazy and outlandish as you can to make this good TV. And and these two guys went at it and went completely offside. I don't even want to start talking about what happened, but it's involving their mom. They were, they were talking about each other's moms. And the world, so one looks... guy was talking about the other guy's mom. Well, okay, one guy yeah. said, oh, this was wild. This was fucking wild. <laughs> one guy is saying he's got burst by a personality disorder and then he's you know he's, he's, he's like going off saying i can do whatever the fuck i want and blah 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 and then the other guy's like you know how i am bro he's like you don't want to fuck with me then he says to her he says literally he says i will fuck your mother in front of you i will torture your mother in front of you i will kill you i will kill your mother like i'm pretty sure that's not legal <laughs> like that's it's, not a lawyer, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's like a that's a farce. That's not Phil Hellmuth mumbling under his breath. He's going to shut fucking burn the place down. This is a guy literally graphic. It's a direct thing. threat to another person. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what ended up happening with that, but my goodness, and that guy who was saying it, like, you feel like he was being oh, honest. Yeah. Like it just felt real. Like it felt genuine to me. Like this guy's like not somebody to fuck with. He, he, he that was that was wild. And you know, I guess the question comes up with like these live streams, right? Like, is this what we want? Right. Like everyone says, oh, you know, it'll help poker is characters and this and that. Like then you go to this place and I'm like, I don't know, man. It is interesting. It's certainly viral. Uh, and does it have what do you guys think? Does it have a place? I feel like I feel like they were happy about it. Like, I feel like they, you know, in spite of the fact that they've, you know, banned these two guys from the stream and, you know, they they don't condone this behavior. I feel like it got clicks. And, and unfortunately, in today's world, it feels like anything that gets clicks like they're just. They're just real happy about it. But this is this is just <laughs> I've got a tweet. I know it's not the tweet sections, but Barry Carter had just a banger of a tweet. And it's the difference between MTTs and cash games. And on his he got a picture on the left with Espen Yorstad saying, you know, we are going to go for a sauna and smoothie. And then on the right, <laughs> it's got the dude saying, I will fuck your mother in front of you and torture you her while you watch. <laughs> and he captions it the difference between MTTs and cash games. And it's so true. <laughs> like the, the the people who play like cash games are just often the worst dregs of humanity. Like in um, tournaments, everyone's talking about whether you cold plunge first before you, yeah, yeah. you know, like when you yeah. Wait. What do you do the sauna, the cold plunge? What, right. what meditation app do you use, Daniel? Uh, right. And then like, what kind of oils are safe to eat? And in this fucking cash game, it's like 
I'll kill you and your mother. And then, oh to God. Terrence's point, right after the guy says this thing about the mother, the, the commentator doesn't know what to do because it's live, right? I, I don't know. Uh, let's go to the chip counts. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Ross, put that in. If you could just clip that part of those guys, like the in the end of the tirade, and then her just saying, "Okay, let's check the chip counts." I, I mean, it's just from- it's the deep dive. What's the baseball thing? What's the baseball thing where the guy's apologizing? It's like, oh, there's a deep drive into left field by Castilla. <laughs> like it's that it's that moment for poker. Oh my god, it's just <laughs> I feel horrible for that person who had to do the the commentary for that. Like, what do you do? It, I mean, it should have been shut down right up. Like, I mean, they got to stop the game. They didn't. They got to stop the game and end the stream. Like you can't like Daniel's point. That's illegal. Like that's a violent. How is there no floor just going like stop or I'm going to kick you out of this game. I mean, there's absolutely no question. If the guy pressed charges, they have video. He literally threatened his life. His mother. You can call you like that. You can't use like, no, he was just joking because he was angry. And you know, there's no, it's, it's open and shut. Like that is just a, that is a threat of death. I mean, isn't it? I don't know. Down, yeah, it's 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 crazy that it, it continued and it crazy. I, I guess they've both been banned for a time period. They didn't even ban them forever. They just banned them for some time out or something. I don't know what happened. Twenty four hours. Yeah, it's just like oh my god. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, it, to to the point. Like, if you've ever wondered what playing in poker in L A is like, I've that, played that's a lot right of poker there. in L A. I don't think I've seen anything like that. Although I'll tell you what I did see. I did see a guy <laughs> at Hollywood Park pick up a chair and these are these, it was a chair of the people. Like it had steel fucking like legs on it. <laughs> and he picked it up in the one seat and he threw it across the table, like legs first and hit the guy square in the eye with a leg uh, with the other seat and knocked him over, busted blood everywhere. It was that, that was pretty bad. I, I've seen some. I've seen somebody get stabbed. Like, I mean, it's not poker's not like poker's way cleaner than it used to be. It's not, it's still not a nice place, but I've seen people get stabbed at the poker table. What was the, like, there was a tweet, uh, somebody put, somebody asked like the over under, somebody asked an old school poker player what like the over under on number of deaths at the table was. And it was like the person put in like, a th- put in thousands oh, yeah. or something like that. I mean, oh, just, yeah, hundred you know, like, like, like actual oh, murders. murders. Yeah. I thought you meant no mur- actual murders, not death. Not, not not like a killed over had a heart attack. Like actual murders. Wow. Daniel, what's the craziest thing you've seen in a, at a poker table? <laughs> God, you know I hate that question. I mean, not not your fault, but like I get that question. I'm so bad at those ones because then you have to go back to your memory bank and you're not know, sitting here going, "Oh, yeah, I don't know." I'm so bad. There's obviously been crazy shit. Like, no. Not, <laughs> right. Okay, that's not violent. I'll tell you the, the craziest thing I ever saw was also at Hollywood Park, and it was like. This is way back in the day. You got to understand, like there was a, a there was no no limit hold'em in in Los Angeles at the time. But the Hollywood Park had a five five pot limit hold'em game, and that was the only not limit event or not limit game in the city. And we're playing it at one night on like a Tuesday night at like three in the morning. There was like I don't know seven of us or something, and a bunch of Arabian dudes like right out of a movie with like the hats with the things around them and the robes. Like eleven of them come in, walking in in Inglewood, California, right? Like it's not Beverly Hills; it's fucking Inglewood, and they want to play poker. And they, they the guys walk up, and one guy has a satchel with like uh, tons and tons of ten thousand dollars in bands, and we're playing five five P, like pot limit hold'em. Like some of us have, you know, a couple four or five hundred bucks in front of us, whatever it is. And they sit down, they take the three seats, and the the guy with the satchel. Throws each of them a brick of ten thousand. They all buy in ten thousand, and then they the, the other ones go over and they're playing tw- fifteen thirty limit hold them and twenty forty limit hold them at like maybe one game of each. And they all sit down and the guy throws a brick of ten. And those guys were there for five days straight. And you should have seen the room. It was packed for five days. Uh, of, you know the floor men were getting tipped four hundred dollars to get them in the game above the like it was the most bananas thing I've ever seen in my life. And one of the guys was like. I don't know, a sheik or something. And when he'd go into the bathroom, he had a servant go with him. And we we're like, why is this guy going to the bathroom with the servant? And the fucking servant wipes his ass. He's like, yeah, he wipes his ass. Yeah, I, I got, I remembered it. Now. For me, the, 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 just, and then I, this isn't even that crazy, but it was like stuck in my memory because I was young. You know, late 90s, early 2000s at the Mirage, Ted Forrest was playing Hamid Desmalchi, Heads Up yeah. Raz. Okay. And uh, they were, you know, playing for days, and Hamid was drinking, doing whatever, I don't know, right? 
And I went in, you know, on the on a on the Thursday night to play. I go home Friday. They're still there. It's like Sunday, the fourth, the third or fourth day. I'd never seen this before. Probably won't. Well, maybe we will again. But they had to, like, literally an ambulance came to wheel Hamid out on a stretcher. Yeah, because he was. I mean, he was like, I don't know what he had going on. Like, they wheeled him out in a stretcher. So they brought a stretcher into the poker room, you know, and, and pulled him out. So Ted, you know, you know, when people joke, they say, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm, when I'm done with you, I and mean, they're gonna wheel you out in a stretcher." <laughs> that actually happened. It happened. <laughs> oh my god, that's crazy. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, we don't have a drop right now, but uh, getting onto some tweets, uh, Terrence, you dived into them already. One of them I saw was from Cole Self, and I thought this was interesting. Cole's an old school uh, online player. Uh, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but he tweeted, "When I was a poker pro, it was a badge of honor not to be results oriented. Uh, this mindset was critical for a narrow 52 card game, but massively overrated by successful poker players in business life. Pretty much everything other than playing cards." Yes, the concept of probability EV is super important when evaluating any decision, but away from the poker table, there are so many variables, both known and unknown, involved in any decision and outcome. Results are by far the best indicator of the quality of your decision. I keep seeing poker players talk about how important it is to not be results-oriented. It is in non-gaming situations. I couldn't disagree more. Uh, this mindset is mostly a defense mechanism to protect your ego from decisions that resulted in poor outcomes. It holds you back from taking an honest look at things and improving your decision-making going forward. In real world, you can't pay your rent with Sclancy bucks and nobody wants to hear about your bad beat stories. I thought this was interesting um, because uh, it didn't occur to me that this is the case. Like I've always thought, and I imagine, you know, Terrence and Danny, you guys think of this too, but think of it as uh, an EV decision, uh, you know, not just poker, but life. Uh, the things that you do, um, results are, well, I did the best thing that, that with the information I had at the time, it didn't work out for me. Um, I still made a good decision, but Cole basically is saying that that's not the case. Uh, Terrence, what did you do? What do you think of sort of that, that thought process? I, I think the issue is that in life, there are a lot of unknown unknowns, right? And in, in poker, we have one unknown. It's, it's like, what's, what's the right play. And then like, what's, and then there's some there's some outcome that happens. Like you, so you make the play. It was either the right play or the wrong play. And then the outcome happens, and it just happens once. But hopefully in your career, it happens tens of thousands of times. So your EV gravitates towards whatever that decision would be. But life is not that way, right? Like so when you're deciding when these these kids Daniel uh, played poker with, they're deciding what college to go to or what what major to. They only get to make that decision once. And we don't get the counterfactual of what if they'd made a different decision? What if they met this girl at the party instead of the other girl? We, we don't really, we, we don't really know the EV of any of these decisions because there are all these unknowns, unknowns. We don't get to see the other end of the world poker. We do, right? We, we know, okay, we had eight diamonds left in the deck and you know, 38 not diamonds. So we, we know mathematically like what's the correct play here if we're looking for a diamond. I, I think that's the point. So yeah, I, I like the tweet because most of the times, if you are just getting bad results over and over and over in life, it's probably because you are making poor decisions. Because actually, some decisions have very low variance in life, right? Like the, the, the people that you choose to hang around, you, you don't need a huge sample size to know whether the people that you're surrounding with are positive people. You can you can determine that very quickly. Like just, just look around. You can make good decisions about life in a wide variety of ways. Um, and if you continue to con consistently get poor outcomes, you're probably doing something wrong. I, I think that's the point he's trying to yeah, get to. I want, I'm going to use a practical example because I really believe, I love what he had to say. I think it's so brilliant, right? I'm going to use a practical example. We're going to go with dating, okay? So imagine like you've had experience with four women, okay? You took, you took, you took approach number A, whatever, this machismo approach twice uh, with two women, you know, and it worked. And then you tried another approach with the other two women. It didn't work. So you're like, oh, no, sorry. Uh, well, I had the numbers wrong. Okay. So let's say there was a, so let's say whatever approach you've used, right? And you, you know, you count the number. If one has been more successful for you, it is probably a better choice for you, right? Like when you make bad decisions in life, I wish I had this so well said when Terrence was speaking. <laughs> Um, but you, you basically, don't worry. Mine sounded better in my head too. You know, so you, you essentially learn from trial and error and mistakes, right? So you see what works and what doesn't work for you. 
whether that's fitness, whether that's health, whether that's decisions and like you said, and making friends or women, the types of women that you choose to date or, you know, whatever, you, you start to notice patterns of like, okay, well, this, this seems to be working well. So in all likelihood, faced with a similar decision, again, let's say you're choosing from two different types of women, right? You know, this type of woman has worked out really well for you. This one hasn't. Okay. Now you're, uh, you know, you're given a choice, right? Well, you have all this data already. So then, you know, you can make these, you know, decisions based on results of what actually happened rather than like the method itself. Like you could learn a method for picking up women and someone says, this is a tried and true method. It works. Okay. Yeah. So you write it in a book. It's the correct way. Well, well, maybe it's not for you though. So you've noticed doing this works better than that. That hasn't worked for you, but this does. So now, you know, you learn from that and you actually go with it because like, even with poker, even with poker, right? You have no information on somebody at all. Right. But then you get to like play online with them and you've played and they've played uh, like a hundred hands or 50 hands. That's nothing. Right. And it's, it's an irrelevant sample size. But if their VPIP is 65 or their VPIP is 12, you can make decisions off, just off that. And they're in the long run more likely to be correct than not in terms of how you're judging this person. Right. Obviously, there will be anomalies, but overall, you know, you, you'll, you'll be on the right side of it. So I like what he had to say. It made complete sense to me that like results do matter, you know, and then how things play out um, are, are like more likely to be repeatable if you're in the same situation and you, you, know, you choose that way versus the other way. Uh, all right. So we have one other tweet to, to get to real quick. Uh, Daniel, this is a tweet by you. In the old days, we played poker tourneys with a guy named Richard Tatalovich, and he would often take 15 to 30 seconds before acting. We call them the human rain delay, and no one took more than five seconds on until the river back then. Today, he'd be the fastest player on tour, which is kind of sad, right? Like that we've got to the point where, you know, somebody who took fifteen to thirty seconds at every every uh, decision would now be the fastest player out there. Well, you would you know, here. I guess what I you know didn't say in the tweet, but what people didn't realize is how much how pissed off people were at this. Yeah. Like this guy on the flop would take seven seconds, even if he took sometimes like it was checked to him and he took five, six seconds to check or to bet, people would give him shit for that. Like people in the day, in the late 90s or 2000s, it was check, check, bet, bet call. There was no, t- like if you watched, if you had a chance to ever watch a heads up event that I played for in the World Series of Poker Europe against Barry Shulman for a bracelet, the World Series of Poker Europe title, the speed in which we played back then was lightning. The camera angles couldn't keep up. Because by the time the camera was on, it was already boom, boom, boom. It was like, he would go raise, call, boom, 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 like that, you know? And obviously I understand why the game slowed and it's become more advanced, but like just seeing how way back then it was not acceptable at all, like even remotely. And now we've, you know, sort of had to live with it and had to find ways around it. And most of the events I play, you know, are going to have a shot clock to somewhat combat it. But yeah, the playing experience, you know, like, yeah, people like that, they, they just, no, they got – now people just sort of accept it as part of the game, you know? But back then, especially if we're on the bubble, oh, my God, people basically would call you a cheater if you were doing yeah. it. This is why I just I just don't play No Limit anymore. I just don't. I've opted out of playing it because I don't do it. And in Limit tournaments, just, just Limit poker, it just doesn't happen. Even when you're playing 8-game and you're playing No Limit and PLO, people play faster because it's just like the culture around people who play mixed is it's just faster. Like there's no – to, you know, Love this yeah, guy. It, it's not as good as it used to be. But, he's a yeah. great player, like really good. And he's actually thinking at a high level, but like Matthew Ashton, you know, he's a high stakes cash game player. When he plays these terms, stuff like, holy shit, man. You know, it's on, you know, four street and stud and stuff. And he's like, quick take 20 seconds. He's just like, but again, he's not wasting time. He's trying to play as quickly as he can. He just, yeah. he's thinking about more stuff. He's good. I don't know. Uh, all right, boys, uh, that's going to wrap it up. We're up against the clock. I think we've just uh, eclipsed an hour, so another tight hour for the boys. Awesome job, work, uh, awesome work. Thanks to you out there for uh, tuning in. Thanks to you guys for getting together, and we will talk to you soon.